Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to Migrating Traditional Apps from On-Premises to the Hybrid Cloud webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded Wednesday, June 25th. 2014. I would now like to turn the webinar over to the Cloud Solutions Architect, Mr. Jared Giles. Please go ahead, sir. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We apologize for the delay. As Frank mentioned, I'm Jared Childs. I'm a Cloud Solutions Architect here at Rackspace. I've been here for about seven and a half years. Uh, looking forward to talking to you all today about migrating traditional apps from on-premises to the hybrid cloud. I'd also like to introduce my peer here, uh, Guillermo, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody. My name is Guillermo Rodriguez. I am a virtualization engineer here at Rackspace. I've been uh, doing virtualization using VMware at Rackspace now for the past five years. Thank you, Guillermo. So uh, in my role at Rackspace, I spend a lot of time working with customers and, and helping them to build strategies for how they want to leverage hosting services. And so uh, if, you've, if you've ever been involved with one of my other webinars, I did one recently on security and some other topics, you'll see that my style is really more educational. This isn't meant to be a specific product pitch or anything like that. Uh, now, that said, of course, this is involving some of our VMware technologies, and that's why I have my guru here, Guillermo, who can help to uh, fill some questions and add some additional context as we, as we go through this about how they, they operationalize and support some of these technologies that are involved with uh, this topic as well. So as we go through this, we're going to start off and be talking about the, the process that a lot of customers we work with, how we go through. Uh, making these changes and help them figure out how to migrate to hosting services, helping them choose the platform that they want to leverage, whether it's going to be uh, cloud hosting or a dedicated platform, a VMware type environment, or even private OpenStack environment. Um, after that, we'll talk about some of the options more specifically as it relates to hybrid hosting and some of the benefits of hybrid hosting. And then we'll wrap up showing how what hybrid really means to Rackspace, because hybrid has a lot of different definitions out there in the industry. And I'll talk a little bit about how Rackspace actually does hybrid and some of the enabling technologies that we use. And we'll close it up with some, some reference architectures and things like that. So let's go ahead and, and get into it. First off, of course, we like to keep our, our lawyers happy and busy. So please uh, respect the trademarks throughout this presentation. And this is meant for educational purposes, so it's as is. And let's uh, get on into it. So the very first thing that generally comes up when we start talking to someone that has an application, or maybe an entire portfolio of applications within their own data centers, is you have to really look at the different types of approaches that you would take to move these applications to a hosting provider. There's a lot of different platforms out there, and we don't believe cloud is for everything. There's a lot of really good uses for cloud. That's a big part of our portfolio and something we stand behind. But we do run into occasions where we look at people that have a uh, very traditional application types, and some of these applications are not well suited for the cloud um, based on the type of dependencies they have on infrastructure for availability um, resilience versus having a lot of those problems solved at the application layer. And so that when you look at the approaches, you may take one of those really traditional applications and you may look at refactoring the entire thing, rebuilding it from the ground up for the cloud, um, a cloud-aware application, if you will. But we could easily spend a, a whole hour just talking on that topic as well, uh, but that's not primarily the focus here. What we want to talk about today is, is an easier path and, and something that can help enable the, the journey to the cloud you will. And that's more of an incremental path via hybrid cloud, leveraging the best of both worlds, some traditional um, platform technologies like VMware or even dedicated bare metal servers mixed alongside with cloud services as well. You know, in years past, the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time talking about cloud benefits to people. Uh, I think that you all probably have a pretty good, pretty good grasp of this now. There's the obvious, the most obvious benefits of the cloud is the elasticity, the ability to spin up and spin down resources on demand to, to follow the, the demand pattern within your application so that you don't have more resources, resources deployed than you need or, or not enough resources, which goes right into performance optimization. That ability when you all of a sudden end up um, maybe presented on some type of news website or something that or have a marketing campaign that's driving a tremendous amount of traffic to your application, you need the ability to optimize quickly, make changes quickly and on demand, if you will. And this is some of the additional benefits of cloud. Security. Security is uh, 
interesting topic when you come to cloud. Some people are pretty convinced that that's you know the, the two don't belong in the same uh, phrase together. But there's a lot of benefits of using hosting providers and cloud solutions in general. Uh, leveraging resources and, and companies that data centers are the, the core of their business, not in context to their business, that have large teams of security experts, uh, some of the top class security experts in the industry, maintaining things like ISO 27001 and PCI compliance in their data centers, a lot of things that are really, really hard to do, really expensive to do, and hard to attract and retain the kind of talent you need to manage those kinds of things in-house. And finally, and you know, most obviously from a business perspective, cost optimization. If you're not finding benefits in terms of cost and operational efficiencies, it really wouldn't make sense to begin with. And obviously people have found a lot of opportunities for cost optimization with this model, which is why it's been so successful in the last few years. So the way I want to break this down at a pretty high level, I mean, these are obviously going to be some pretty big buckets that we'll talk to, but the, the process that people look at uh, when they're determining whether they're going to refactor an application or whether they're going to migrate the application, there's really five steps that I break it down into that we look at in a successful hybrid cloud migration. I want to start off and set some context. In many, many, many of the cases where we go look at this type of option, most people have already virtualized a large majority of their workloads. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of people are using VMware. So an assumption that we'll start off with is we're looking at a, a VMware environment deployed in someone's data center or a co-location facility that may have some type of storage back end like an EMC storage platform, perhaps a VNX or VMAX, and a traditional three-tier type of application, a web layer, an application layer, um, a database layer. So this is a really common architecture that we look at, uh, but people are looking at how they they can get more efficient in managing these type of applications. Maybe they don't have um, the best interest of keeping the lights on and managing everything as much as they would prefer to have a partner to manage and keep the lights on and do a lot of the maintenance of the infrastructure for them where they can focus on the things that are more meaningful to them, such as driving revenue for the business and building new features and new exciting applications that they can monetize. So one of the first exercises and one of the most important things, when we get involved in an engagement where someone has a, an application that they're trying to figure out what to do with, what platform should it ride on, is really understanding how the application itself works. And so we do application profiling workshops, we call them, where we sit down, we work with developers, we work with systems administrators, uh, architects, and folks that are very familiar with the applications or the application, the entire application portfolio potentially, and create data flow models, understanding the different components that are involved with an application, how the application functions. And this is inherently a very big uh, change that's really occurred over the last few years in the way hosting providers in general and in the industry worked with customers. It used to be people just came and said, I need this much CPU or this much memory, uh, this much disk. And then we would just, you know, give our mad scientists in the back office and start building out a configuration that made sense for that. But now, and, and that was largely because there was just one simple platform that most people were choosing from. Either you're just using dedicated servers uh, maybe some basic VPS type hosting options, or maybe you were looking at uh, a simple VMware solution. But now it has changed quite a bit with the era of the infrastructure as a service, shared nothing architectures in the cloud, uh, and, and that's created this requirement where rather than just taking orders of how much memory someone needs, we really have to back into it. We need to understand how the application works in order to make the right recommendation, the right platform, for you to really get the best out of uh, what you're looking for. Going through this exercise, it gives us insight into the dependencies. Uh, there are different applications that are or different services within the application that are communi communicating together that have incredibly low latency requirements. Maybe these services actually need to reside even on the same host, potentially, depending on how it's constructed. Uh, other things as well, risk associated with the types of data. Maybe there are certain bits of data that are, an application is managing that you're not comfortable being in a multi-tenant environment. Those types of data may make best sense for you to be in a single-tenant environment. Or is there maybe other pieces of that application that does make sense in a multi-tenant environment? Other things as well that we're identifying in here have to do with uh, you know, if, if you have failover requirements between servers that require things like shared storage, that could be a pretty big red flag that we're looking at when you consider things like cloud infrastructure or cloud solutions that generally have a shared nothing type of architecture where you're not sharing storage. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get application profiling done. 
you look at Rackspace, we do what we call application profiling workshops. We have advisory services teams that can come out and spend a lot of time doing this with you. Or if it's just a light level of engagement, this just might be something that one of our solutions engineers or solutions architects might work through with you. Uh, in some cases, when it's really complex and a really vast, expansive set of portfolio that you want to go through, we even have partners that we can bring in to help with really long cycle engagements uh, where you're looking at a very broad portfolio. Some of the common tools out there, so you see UML listed here, that's the Unify Universal Modeling Language. So the industry, of course, as we try to do for everything, is set standards around what modeling looks like, the different ways to do it. But the reality is there ends up being dozens and dozens of different model frameworks that people out there use. One of my personal favorites that I like to use is the, the deployment diagram model. And I have a small example here, just for simplicity's sake. The way a deployment diagram would work is I would have boxes that list the different types of servers in the environment. This is very simple. It shows a single web server, a single application server, a database, and they also so happen to have a mainframe listed out in here. This is a uh, borrowed from agilemodeling.com. It's a great resource. But I've seen these that involve hundreds of boxes. But the idea here is you're listing out all the services that run on these different boxes, and you want to start breaking it down and understanding why are these services running on the same server. Is there a reason that these could be separated or something that keeps them from being separated? But it gives you a really good visibility into the data flow, how things move around, where the components are that are required to work together. And it's really important to understand these things in order to be able to architect and, and optimize the type of architecture that's going to make the best sense for you. One of the main goals of breaking things down in this manner is not every component is going to be suitable for a cloud environment, or in some cases, aren't going to be suitable for being on the dedicated side inside the VMware environment. So we really want to try to see if everything maybe in its current state, does not make sense in one or the other. But if you break apart the functions, can they reside in the cloud? That's right. And it's really all about finding the, the best solution, mixing different ends of the portfolio, such as cloud and dedicated hosting, to really maximize your spend and maximize the type of performance that you're going to get out of the solution, as well as addressing some of those other things I mentioned, like, like risk. So I mentioned that you know, one of the key things is really understanding the dependencies between each of the processes, all the interactions between the processes. Well, we're really looking for those types of red flags, such as latency. Uh, and it's one of the really interesting topics. When you talk about hybrid cloud, and I mentioned, uh, I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I mentioned some of the, the different types of definitions of hybrid out in the industry. And you have a lot of folks that have done things such as put some single tenants, some dedicated infrastructure in a co-location facility. And then they might use a, a hosting provider like Rackspace or, or some of the others out there for a different portion of the application portfolio or of the application for the cloud services. But there's one little piece in there that's really important that physics hasn't quite been able to solve for us yet, and that's the speed of light. So what you end up running into when you have these multi-site types of applications that are spread out is you do have a, a dependency on, on latency in the middle. I shouldn't say dependency on latency. You have a latency factor that you have to take into consideration. Unless those data centers are basically sitting side by side, this could be really impactful into the way that you design your application. Whereas in Rackspace case, which I'll talk more about in a bit, when you're able to have a cloud portion of your application as well as a dedicated portion of your application within the same data center, those types of latency concerns go away and ultimately starts feeling like it's all on one local area network. So these are the types of things that we're really looking out for. Requirements around latencies, requirements around shared storage, uh, failover requirements where the application itself is not able to be resilient and needs uh, that resilience built in at the infrastructure layer. That's one thing that VMware has been really, really solid about solving. And there's a number of different technologies built into VMware in the way that we cluster these services that help to solve for some of these problems. Guillermo, if you want to touch on a few of those, those primary points that it's able to solve for. I mean, one of the basic things that we can do to reduce latencies is on the networking side. Uh, one of the biggest benefits that virtual machines have when they reside on the same VM, on the same ESX host is that they don't have to worry about network communications over the copper anymore. All of that network communication happens at bus speed. So we're talking about a real quick way of knocking down latency in between different uh, virtual machine components. That's a really good point. And then just some of the other capabilities aside from latency, when you're looking at high availability, the, the vMotion, the DRS, the HA built into VMware can automatically help that failover if you have one hypervisor go down, whereas in the cloud you're constructing for a model, um, an expectation of failure type model is what's really being promoted in the industry, where you can consider a VM going down and that's 
If you have a VM that can go down that can tank your entire application, it's really not well suited for the cloud. If you have that type of design where you have virtual machines that have critical bits that must be online all the time, you need a failover model that VMware is able to manage with those types of uh, clustering capabilities. So they're actually, when I talk about key application characteristics, there's a, sorry, I thought we had the link in here. There's a, a blog series on rackspace.com slash blog by a peer of mine named Wayne Walls, and he, he wrote this blog called The Pillars of Cloudiness, The Five Pillars of Cloudiness. I highly recommend if you're ever looking at re-architecting an application or building an application from the ground up to be well suited for a pure cloud type solution, infrastructure as a service type solution. He has uh, really nailed it down, made it simple and consumable. It's a complex problem. It's a, it's a complex thing to do, but he really breaks down the key concepts that you should be considering. And the reason why that's important even when you're doing application profiling, when you're looking at different parts of the application, you're comparing it to those kinds of things. Does it meet those types of expectations of what an application should look like to function well in the cloud? So as we move on to step three here, it's really now we've done some application profiling, we've identified uh, dependencies and things within the application, it's time to build out the hybrid environment. And the most important part to start with, of course, is understanding the application, the resource requirements. There's a, a simple way of doing this where you just look at the total resources that you're currently consuming and you make sure that the environment you build out matches that. But that really, if, if you just take that approach, it's a very baseline approach, it's not necessarily given the opportunity to drive new efficiencies. Generally, the way you would want this to start, and you can tag this on to an application profiling workshop, is looking at the monitoring tools that are in place. If you don't have enough monitoring tools, we're looking at resource, resource utilization, not just at the host level, but at the virtual machine level. How much memory it's utilizing, how much CPU it's utilizing, the amount of disk it's utilizing, and how's that trending over time? Is it flatline? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? The more information you have on that, the more intelligent you can think about the way that you build out the future solution. Another thing to take into account is when you're sizing your virtual machines, especially inside the VMware environment, um, for those of you who already have your, an existing install base with VMware, you've probably already figured this out, but for those of you who are, are exploring that, you really want to go with a minimalist approach when you, when you dole out the resources. Virtual machines work best when they are just given what they need to operate. It lets the ESX, uh, the, the vSphere scheduler work optimally to uh, schedule the resources out for those individual VMs. So it's kind of an inverse of how the previous dedicated thinking was where you always purchase the biggest, beefiest box you could when you, when you know you want those types of resources. You really want to make sure that everything is kind of sort of a just-in-time approach. And always understand that it's a very flexible environment. So in the, if you ever need to increase the CPUs or the RAM allocations to those virtual machines, you always have that option. That's a good point. And when you think about how you scale that environment in terms of adding resources, there's a couple pieces. If it's an actually a hybrid environment, you do have that ability to burst into the cloud where you're capable and comfortable of doing it as components, as components of the application. But the other piece is a lot of people, when they think of elasticity, they immediately their mind thinks specifically about cloud services and the ability to get stuff on demand. But if you have the right kind of resource monitoring in place where we're able to look at trends and see utilization changes over time, there is still an extent of elasticity when you're using a hosting provider. We have a giant inventory and supply chain where the matter of adding host into a VMware environment may just be a matter of days or weeks versus if you're trying to go through an entire procurement process in-house and managing capital in-house. Uh, most people I talk to, that process looks like months when they try to manage it in-house. So I think we actually covered this slide quite well, but mm -hmm. again, you know, that. There's the baseline piece to where you're building out your VMware environment, making sure that you have enough resources and you optimize for the right resources, but also understanding those trends can drive a pretty major way that you architect the application as well, such that if you have a web layer that you'll know that your, your standard requirement may be whatever, four 8-gig servers or 10 4-gig virtual machines uh, running all the time, but you know that once a week or on certain times of the day that you're going to see a specific time of type of spike, you can build your baseline application, that web layer, into your VMware environment and then leverage that cloud solution just for the spike part versus having to build all of that resource into your baseline environment. So this is where you really start driving a lot of cost optimization as well, where you're just leveraging those cloud resources when you need them and you have your always-on resources running always-on, of course, in an environment that's reliable that you're not, you don't have to worry about the multi-tenancy na nature of noisy neighbors and things that you run into of cloud providers. Uh, the, the ability to have complete control over that environment. 
you have a noisy neighbor in a single tenant environment, you are the noisy neighbor. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy to go back and troubleshoot that type of problem. So now we get into uh, further from building up the hybrid environment. We have a good baseline. We understand what needs to be there. How do we get our data over there? How do we get our images over there? And this really breaks down into two different buckets. There's image porting, which a lot of people think is, is nirvana, but we're going to talk about this a little bit. And then you have data migration, which is really building up from a clean slate and then moving your, the important data bits that you need over. So first, let's talk about image porting. So there's some of the obvious things that seem here. It seems like a very easy thing to do. It seems like a very sim simplistic approach to take. And when you have things like a dedicated VMware vCenter, which Rackspace has launched recently, so you have the ability to own the vCenter, have access to the APIs. You may have vCenter deployed in your own data center, so you can use different kinds of tools to, to migrate images between these two, two solutions. That's an easy approach. There's no doubt that's an easy approach. It may not necessarily be the best approach. You may be bringing over some baggage. Uh, maybe you don't have those images optimized the way you could. So you can really look at this as an opportunity to have a clean slate, to undo some of the things that you may have done in the past. But absolutely, this is a viable option when you, have, uh, when you own the vCenter on both sides, uh, just to move those VMDKs over, and, and certainly is a, an approach that uh, some people are very keen on taking. One of the biggest things that I would uh, recommend when planning porting your images is to use the OVF format. The OVF format is going to be the quickest and most error-free way of, uh, of exporting your images and bringing them into the Rackspace environment. Uh, sometimes what we find is when just the VMDK files get sent is uh, there might be an issue with the version or th there might not be the exact same thing that it was running on. I, we've had customers even send us uh, stuff from VMware from Fusion and expect it to run on ESXi. And sometimes we can make it work uh, through conversion processes, but it doesn't always work out and it doesn't always get delivered at the same timeline. OVF is probably going to be the best route to take in that sense. Of this is of course assuming that your images as you currently have them on premise are how you want them when you send them to, the, to us. Yeah, that's really good advice, Kama, thank you. And also I'll add, when you look at image porting, if you're doing the hybrid solution, you have the, the cloud aspect or the infrastructure as a service aspect. A lot of different providers out there, including Rackspace, are either have or are building um, different act ways of importing images into the public cloud. When you look at Rackspace and one of our big differentiators, one of our big value pieces, the ability to manage those images for you, the challenge you run into when you import an image into a cloud with that kind of service, we don't have the ability to have our tools installed on it, we don't have our support accounts installed on there. So you really start to strip away some of the value that you might bring if you leverage one of the images that's built within Rackspace. So that's another thing that you should certainly consider as well. So on the second point, you have the data migration approach. In the data migration approach, um, effectively, you've built out the hybrid environment, which, well, you've done in either case. You've installed your applications. You've tuned everything within your applications. And literally, you just have to start copying the data between the two. Uh, I don't mean that for that to sound overly simplistic. That can be quite a, a task itself. And, and we actually have a team that's designed to help this type of uh, process. We have a team called the Cloud Movers. And what these guys will do is they'll go in, install the tools within your environment to have access to look at the directory structures, the type of applications, do an assessment to figure out if their tools are able to move the applications over for you. Uh, so this works in certain cases. In other cases, you might be looking at using a professional services partner like web movers, website movers, uh, or a handful of other partners that we have that can get involved in helping with the data migration itself too. A real common technique that I've seen some customers employ is once they realize that they need to re-architect some of the other pieces of uh, their, uh, their applications, they leverage this as an opportunity to move into the cloud. So it's like, oh, well, you know, we want to really optimize this application for the newest version of PHP, or, or we really want to run on, uh, move over from a Windows-type environment to a Linux-type environment to run these apps. This is usually when they leverage this, this specific event to make that transition. So it's kind of taking down two birds with one stone. And so one of the final points I want to bring up, specifically when you talk about going to a managed service provider, when you look at these types of things, and this is a large part of what we've talked about, you know, this entire process can be quite cumbersome and quite complex, from the application profiling workshop to building out and architecting the solution to uh, actually working on the, the data migration. So one of the key things when you're leveraging a managed service provider versus an unmanaged service provider is, is support throughout this entire process, guidance throughout this entire process, and a lot of hands-on help as well 
which enables you to really focus on the things that drive value for your business versus spending a lot of man hours sucking up a lot of your scarce IT resources managing this kind of process. Now we're getting closer to the end of this actual, uh, this first part of this presentation talking about the process, but I want to bring this up and really emphasize this point. I, it, it's mind-boggling to me how often I've seen people build out solutions, migrate everything, and never really take the time to bring in a, a partner or a solution to really load test the environment and make sure that everything's working. And a big part of doing that load test is not just making sure the application is functional, but making sure that you have your processes really nailed down to understand how you're going to manage as the load changes within the environment. So it's verifying that scaling really works. If you have a web layer that's using the cloud and you've done things like built out auto scale groups leveraging the Rackspace cloud uh, to automatically scale that, you want to make sure those triggers are, are hitting and, and the, the environment's actually scaling the way that you expect. Um, also, you need to understand the process for cloning VMs or deploying more VMs in the, the VMware type environment. In addition to that, if, if you don't have everything set down to be automated, you at least need to make sure that you have the process that documented of how you manually do uh, scaling activities and how you uh, manage these types of uh, unexpected events, if you will. So there's a lot of different aspects. It's not just making sure the application so itself works, but it's making sure that you know how to handle uh, unexpected events or really large traffic type of events within the environment and make sure it's optimized well to, to function still through those types of encounters. And finally, the big scary day where you're actually changing DNS settings and cutting over the environment. One of the approaches I really like, which depends on the type of uh, load balancing or geographic load balancing type capabilities that we've deployed or that we've worked with you to manage, is the ability to move certain sets of users over into the environment at a time. So you really have kind of a canary group that you can test functionality with, make sure they're happy with, uh, before cutting everything over. That's not always, always possible, uh, depending on the way the application itself is constructed and the database back end. Um, but the primary point is here, you, you've picked a time where you froze the primary environment, you've cut users over, you've copied that delta of data over, and you've gone into production in the environment. Hopefully by the time you've got to this point, you've also documented very clearly a rollback process to make sure that you do have a means to bring everything back to the original environment in case there was something that was unforeseen or un unexpected that occurs during the going production within the new environment. So to recap all these steps real quick, we talked about profiling the application. During that exercise, you're really examining the application characteristics, looking for different things that might drive the decision to deploy certain components of the application in a dedicated or single-tenant environment versus components that are ready to go in a cloud environment to have a hybrid solution. You're going to build out the environment, talk a lot about the resource monitoring, uh, sizing, and planning in that, in that case, performing the proof of concept, uh, load testing, and then ultimately cutting over the environment. So that concludes the very first part of the presentation, really talking about this process. And again, I, I'll reiterate that, you know, boiling that down into five steps may seem like an oversimplification. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, but if you plan well and you have the right partners engaged to help you through this process, it can be a successful process. It can help you achieve the goals that you're looking for. So now real quick, I want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes left, and we want to leave a little bit of room for a Q&A at the end. I want to talk about hybrid architectures and really the optimal aspects of the hybrid architecture. And I, I alluded to a lot of these points early on in the presentation. Um, but an optimal hybrid application architecture really is about splitting application components located in the dedicated hosting environment and the cloud, the public cloud. So one of the real common aspects that we see to that is taking, is, is when the, the parts of your application that you expect to have the most volatile traffic to, let's say if you're an e-commerce site, the brochure end of your website it's very likely that you're going to have large spikes on that side. The things that you can deal with in terms of maybe a, a checkout cart or a database, generally those types of utilization trends are a little bit more manageable. depends on the application, the workload you, you have. But as a general rule of thumb, this is the most common uh, reason why you would use a hybrid, is using the, the cloud bursting aspects of the cloud in conjunction with storing the sensitive bits, or really maybe you need really custom big large boxes for a database to run on the back end if you're using a more traditional uh, relational database model to manage those ends in the dedicated environment. So how this often ends up looking is a web layer in the cloud in the dedicated components, the application layer in the database back end in the dedicated side. We see this deployment all the time and it's very successful. So as I touched on, this often looks like a sales brochure in the cloud, a shopping cart perhaps on the back end. 
And the way that Rackspace does this is a, is a bit of proprietary technology we built called Rack Connect. And so this is where it really gets into the meat of what hybrid means to Rackspace and how Rackspace differentiates in our hybrid messaging. Because again, I talked about earlier, you know, hybrid may be you have a SaaS application, you have a dedicated, there's not really a wrong definition to hybrid. But generally, in a lot of cases, that involves people using multiple data centers, a cloud data center, and then a dedicated data center with a, some kind of wide area link or metro area link between the two where you're dealing with uh, latencies based on uh, the distance that the data centers are apart. What Rackspace has done with Rack Connect, again, is putting our cloud services and our dedicated services all within the same data center. So you have high-speed backbone links between the two. So it starts with the, the foundational pieces, the switching fabric between the environments, a low latency switching fabric. But it's not just that, you have layers of automation over the top of that. So if I deploy a cloud server uh, that's part of my web cart, and I have, uh, or the web layer, so I have a, maybe a naming convention for that web server is web008 or what have you, or, or metadata that's associated with that cloud server, it's going to automatically drop that server based on that criteria into the right load balancing pool, automatically set up the right network access controls. It's going to manage the software firewalls on the cloud server as well as it's going to manage the dedicated stuff. So you have the switching fabric, you have this layer of automation, and there's more of the automation I'll touch on as well. But not just that, it's the control panel, it's the seamless experience. If you have two disparate environments where you're managing one via one control panel and then you're managing another via more traditional uh, control processes, when you look at this type of solution, Rack Connect is also a hybrid control panel where you're managing the same dedicated resources from one control panel as you are your cloud resources. So it's, a, it's the full-blown experience from the control panel to the automation to the high-speed switching fabric between the two environments that ultimately makes the environment tie together and feel like one solid environment. So here's one of the reference architectures that helps to kind of depict this. And I want to touch a little bit more on one from a security standpoint, especially with our large, large enterprises, a key piece that uh, uh, really drives a lot of enterprise decision with this model. So I've got a, a highlighter here. Let's see if this shows up well enough. I've highlighted the network layer here. So you have on the dedicated side of the house your dedicated firewall, if you want to deploy a web application firewall in there, you can. You can deploy your uh, highly available F5 load balancers. All this can be completely redundant. And one of the key pieces here is that automation I talked about. When you spin up a cloud server, it's effectively going to disable the bu public net interface on that cloud server. And it's going to set the default gateway for that cloud server to be your dedicated environment. So that means all the traffic in and out of your environment, ingress and ingress, whether it's going to the dedicated equipment or whether it's going to the cloud equipment, it all traverses this one a uh, very comfortable network layer that you own in entirety. So you have an inspection point for intrusion detection systems, uh, a gateway where you can tra filter traffic through the web application firewall. Um, like I say, a lot of enterprises, really large enterprises, have very strict policies and requirements around these types of requirements of managing the traffic versus having many, many different uh, ingress points in the environment because every public cloud server has its own public IP ends up being pretty risky from a security standpoint. So this really gives you a lot of control over that environment. The other pieces that I'll point out in here, on the left side, you actually see where we have uh, what's defined as the shopping cart. And this is your VMware farm. So what we've done here is you have the ability to take, uh, let's say someone's gone through the, the brochure process. They're building their pizza, if you will, or they're, they're selecting the clothes they want to buy, or whatever widgets that you may be having in your brochure. Once they've gone through and decided what they want, and they, that moment that they say, okay, I'm ready to check out, you can have that F5 catch the eye rule that basically says, okay, this is going to checkout.yoursite.com. It's going to take that traffic over to your dedicated uh, VMware farm where you have uh, the single tenant environment, you have your highly available constructed application layer to manage that processing. So credit card information, personally identifiable information, uh, none of that ever traverses and touches the public cloud. None of that ever touches a multi-tenant environment that all rides over your dedicated network, over to your dedicated servers. And it's very easy, generally, to uh, quell concerns when you're working with uh, pretty, pretty stringent auditors when you look at that approach of things. So that's not to say that we don't believe a really well-constructed pure cloud application can't be secure. But again, this is about an incremental path, the way to do things that you're, you're quite comfortable with and familiar with to manage these types of things in a hybrid-type environment. Also, what we have shown here is another network segment where we have dedicated database servers. So sure, you can put a database server in a virtual uh, machine environment, in a VMware environment, but let's say you're doing something like an Oracle rack deployment, or uh, you just have a really large uh, database server requirements based on the type of database architecture that you have. This gives you the ability to do some traditional clustering models with that. You can back these into the same backend that you may have in terms of a, 
an EMC dedicated sand storage back in, like a VNX, uh, as well as we have um, a lot of different types of managed backup services that are ready to go PCI compliant to manage these types of things. One of the things that I really like about this diagram is that it highlights that we don't have to settle for just one technology to, to deliver the service that we're trying to, achieve, to, to deliver to our customers. Uh, if you have dedicated you know, bare metal boxes that have to be in that configuration, those can be in the environment and coexist with your VMware environment and also coexist with your cloud environment via Rack Connect. So it, it really gives you a lot of flexibility to ensure that, that you can place your applications and your services on the piece of equipment that's going to, to, to best suit its needs. That's a good point. So you know, this is an e-commerce reference architecture, but I can tell you there's tons and tons of customers that are not necessarily even involved in e-commerce that use very similar type of architectures because they may have data classification policies of what type of data need to live in what types of environments, or again, just based on the types of application, different components of their application um, may run better in a dedicated environment or a VMware environment than on the cloud. So uh, don't let the fact that this is specifically an e-commerce reference architecture uh, throw you off in that regard. This is a very common architecture for a number of different needs. You'll also notice, before I move on to the next slide real quick, I'll point out, if I highlight over here on the catalog display, you'll see a portion of those are still listed as dedicated servers, along with an arrow pointing over to the cloud servers. This goes along that train of thought that you can still have a portion of your always on, your baseline traffic on dedicated environment where it's predictable to manage, and then you're just using cloud when you have that spike where you need additional resources. So it's entirely possible in this type of configuration, there could be days where you're not running any cloud servers. And then when you need them, you deploy them. So it really helps you optimize that cost. So here's a little bit simpler approach. So in this one, you're looking at a, a similar thing in terms of you have web servers on both sides of the equation and the dedicated in the web. You actually have app servers on both sides of the equation. So the model here that this is really demonstrating is kind of along that baseline model. Let's say you know you're always on traffic footprint. You can deploy all that in the dedicated. And when you need more web servers, you need more app servers, you leverage that as you need them. The cloud files is also demonstrated here on the right side. That's our, our, uh, object, our file, object-oriented files uh, storage platform. So a little tongue twisted there. And that thing's Akamai enabled. So it's CDN enabled where if there's any files, let's say it's static web content that you have hosted on a website or a file that you're comfortable to, to have anybody shared to anonymously over the, the global Akamai CDN network, it's nothing but a radio or an API call, a radio button click or an API call, depending on how you want to manage the solution have those files readily accessible. So when you start using those types of additional components, you can really drive a lot of efficiencies in the way your application runs. Because why would you want a web server wasting processing cycles or storage space to send up a, a file, a static file that you're not really changing when you can easily drop that into an object storage platform and enable it over a CDN platform. So further refinement there, we talked about the unexpected traffic spikes of web servers, constant uh, traffic on web servers in the dedicated environment. So this next slide really drives more specifically into the heart of what we've done with dedicated vCenter. So traditionally, uh, Rackspace, what a lot of people don't realize, as much as we, we tout our public cloud offering, we're one of the largest VMware service providers out there, we run well over, what is it, close to 40,000 virtual machines now uh, in our VMware environment. So what we've done in the past is we abstracted the vCenter layer from folks where we just had a, you just manage your environment through the control panel. You didn't actually have direct vCenter access. But we've evolved that offering where we still have that capability. Let's say you don't have VMware talent in-house. But we've added the ability for customers that have a lot of VMware talent in-house. They already know how to manage VMware. Uh, they already have their own vCenter deployments. To have direct access and ownership of their own vCenter environment at Rackspace as well. So when you start having that type of access and that type of ownership, that gives you the ability to lose, use the existing tools that you have in place, the existing scripts that you've built to operate between these two environments. So it really makes for a really seamless experience between in-house VMware platforms and, and uh, VMware platforms that have been deployed with uh, Rackspace specifically. And then, again, a further refinement, the final tier of refinement as we talk through this type of environment, really looking at the opportunity to reduce overhead. That's the amount of people and, and resources that you have in-house having to manage these things. Reducing the latency in the environment when you look at maybe other hybrid solutions out there or different types of architecture opportunities, 
uh, within your application. And then ultimately, the performance impact deployment decision. So defining the, the proper way that you're going to architect the application, the way you can leverage different types of platforms to solve the solution that you're looking to solve for, or solve the problem that you're looking to solve for, without having to try to shove it all into one specific platform. Having the best of both worlds, if you will, having a broad portfolio behind you, and being able to piece those all together in one seamless experience to get the desired outcomes that you're looking for. So this is the final slide before we open up for QA, but I just really want to kind of back this up at a real high level and look at the different kinds of benefits that you look at when you leverage a hybrid cloud solution for Rackspace. From a business perspective, you may be saving time. And when I say saving time, that could be looking at things like refactoring an application from the ground up for a pure cloud solution. It's a very timely exercise. There was a, a really large enterprise customer I was talking to a while back that had gone through a, a large paid uh, assessment with a, uh, an outside consulting firm looking at their application stacking, what it would take to rebuild the entire stack for the cloud. Uh, it was supposed to be a three-year pro process, and they had estimated it was going to cost them about $150 million. Now, that probably doesn't translate necessarily to everybody that's here on this, but it really it struck home with me thinking about the scope of work that it really takes to rebuild all your applications. And you know, there may be some applications there where that makes sense. You may just want to keep the applications that you already have running in ways that you're familiar and comfortable with running, and you may think about building your new applications or greenfield applications from the ground up for pure cloud type solutions. So then there's lowering cost, the amount of money that goes into refactoring an application. Also, when you look at a pure cloud type solution, if half of that environment is always turned on, it may not necessarily be as, as cost effective as if you have a baseline amount on a dedicated environment where you're able to have longer term negotiated prices to drive that pricing down versus a public cloud, you do pay a premium for that on-demand, that elastic nature of the per gig type pricing model. So when you can use the best of both worlds, you can really drive cost optimization. And finally, reducing risk. And I look at that from a couple of standpoints. Putting the data that you're not comfortable in a multi-tenant environment in a single-tenant environment. And also, if you're actually looking at refactoring from the ground up, a really large, complex activity, um, there's a lot of risk induced with uh, the project failing or maybe not getting the desired outcome, the type of performance that you're hoping to achieve. From an IT standpoint, be able to improve control. When you have a dedicated into the environment, you have no worries of multi-tenancy, uh, multi concerns of noisy neighbors. Uh, you own that environment. You have complete control over that environment. And that's a good, good feeling to have in that kind of hybrid type of architecture. You can increase the security, which I talked about risk on the business side, and IT's mind, that's security. That's having the ability to have a network gateway that you own where you can have things like IDS deployed and WAFs deployed and have your dual factor authentication like your RSA uh, secure ID deployments done for VPN connectivity to your firewalls. There's a lot of different things that you can do when you really start consolidating and managing that network fabric from a, from a dedicated standpoint. Not to mention you have your choice of of storage. So, you know, a lot of people have a, a very tight requirements for, for where their data at rest can be. Uh, so you can always leverage the, the dedicated side for some of that uh, more sensitive data. And uh, the public side is for, you know, pretty much what drives that app specifically as opposed to sensitive things like personal information about your customers. That's right. And then finally, that flexibility. That ability, especially if you're running vCenter in-house and you're running vCenter at Rackspace, the ability to, to move the components of your application that you're comfortable between the two environments and own that the API access to vCenter, vSphere, and, and then also the flexibility of knowing the components that you're willing to have bursting into the cloud, having on-demand resources as you need access to it that's directly attached effectively to your dedicated environment. There's a lot of different aspects of flexibility that you really get with that kind of architecture and uh, really, really passionate about the type of solutions that we've been able to do for people and the types of outcomes and the promoters that we've developed by, by building these types of architectures for people. So we've got about nine more minutes according to my clock here, and that concludes uh, the presentation. Uh, we thank you all very much for your time. If there's any questions, please send them through the chat. I believe we've had a, a few that have been answered in real time. Also, you'll notice Guillermo had shared a, a link to the Rackspace.com blog for Pillars of Cloudiness earlier in there. That was the, the blog article I mentioned that, that really dives through cloud-like application architectures. Okay, I've got a question from Casey. Okay. So, uh, so Carrie. Carrie Hutchins Carrie. says, uh, what do you do for applications that are extremely high business value depending on proprietary software that is highly optimized around operating systems and kernel parameters, such as software may also need jumbo packets for high data transfer rates? 
Do you maintain operating systems or do you require upgrades to stay in the requirements of the OS vendors? What are the largest daily data migrations? Okay, so that's the first question. Let's, th let's take that one in chunks. Well, actually, not, that was the second question. So highly optimized around operating systems and kernel parameters. So by kernel parameters, I'm going to assume that you're asking about kernel mode processes, which traditionally, when it comes to a virtualized environment, kernel mode, pro kernel mode processes, since it is a virtualized ring zero of the processor, tends to uh, um, tax the system uh, a lot. It all depends. There, there's a threshold for, for whether or not those are going to perform well in a VMware-based environment or in a cloud environment. Uh, traditionally, if it does prove that it's beyond that threshold, then we usually dedicate that box to a, piece of, to a bare metal. Um, so now, the next question is, such software may also need jumbo packets for high data transfer rates. Or do you maintain operating systems, or do you require upgrades to stay in the requirements of the OS vendors? We're pretty flexible when it comes to operating system patches and upgrades. Um, we always try to ensure that our customers have uh, the option to upgrade or to stay within reason. Um, obviously, after the operating system is aged beyond a certain point, just to maintain supportability uh, for our customers and ensure the best possible experience, we are always going to try to encourage upgrading to the latest version uh, just to keep you on that path. And then the last piece is, what are the largest daily data migrations that you are experiencing? Some applications use rebuilt databases and data files that are rebuilt daily and are used actively. Are those limits to the amount of daily data migrations? What advantages can one gain from moving away from their current environment? Let's see. Some of the largest data migrations that we're experiencing. Well, I mean, I can talk to some edge cases or I could talk to some of the average things that I'm seeing. Uh, on an edge case, I had a customer who is negotiating with us to transfer approximately 50 terabytes of data. Now, this is definitely an edge case because uh, they're actually shipping an entire EMC unit with that data over here. Um, again, <laughs> that's not for everybody, but that's what they wanted to do to make sure that they had everything in one spot and data integrity was maintained. Uh, on average, we have customers who are doing a, a basic initial migration or initial load of their data where they send us a USB drive. Uh, these are transfers that are sub five terabyte. Very good. Good questions, and thank you, Guillermo. Um, I'll give my take on, on some of these probably at a little higher level the way my, my head usually works. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a couple different ways to look at managed services. And when you look at incredibly amount, incredible amounts of customization at the OS, building your own OSs from the ground up, modifying a lot of kernel parameters and things like that, there's really a couple different ways to look at it. One of the primary benefits you get out of a, a managed, say like a systems operations level of managed service that Rackspace might provide, we need to have uh, images and things that are standard to an extent that we can have a, a support staff that's well trained to to manage those types of things for you. So generally, if you're looking for the full blown sysops oriented managed experience, you would be managing or leveraging images that are provided by Rackspace, and that's so that we have again, you know, uh, a consistent experience for our support technicians so that we can provide fanatical support and good experiences for people. If we have too much customization in that regards, it just doesn't scale. It turns into a, an issue, a supportability issue, and we don't want to have bad support outcomes. But that doesn't mean that you don't have, uh, that you can't do that at Rackspace or that you don't have managed support from Rackspace in that regard. What a lot of people don't think about is just the managed infrastructure aspect of what we do. And that's the ability to have access to the large supply chain that we manage, the large inventory that we manage in all of our data centers, data centers deployed around the world globally, and people that are in those data centers walking those floors, making changes, managing hardware, very, very quickly. And it also means you have phone support where you can ask for advice and look for uh, different things that you're looking for. So even our lowest base level of service that we provide generally far exceeds the, some of the higher levels of service that are provided by some of the quote unquote like unmanaged type of service providers out there. So I think it's really a matter of, and this kind of tears back on into one of your